to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Father, this is your word, these are your people, and I am your servant. I pray this day you'll give me the tongue of the learned, that I might speak a word in season to him or her who is weary. Let your word comfort every heart that is disturbed. Let it disturb every heart that is too comfortable. I pray this in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap, will you please? You may be seated. Thank you so much. I'm trying to slow down like a good Baptist preacher. Amen. Well, when Moses was 40, he lived to be 120, but when he lived to be 40, at 40 years old, he had what scholars call a moment where he experienced epistemological self-consciousness, all right, because he became woke. It came into his heart to visit his brothers. Now, he lived to be 120, but when he turned 40, it came into his heart. I would like to suggest this morning, that day, Moses became woke. Now, the term woke, we got we to gotta deal with that. I don't mind. I'll never run for president of the United States. I've never been that kind of person. That was always, well, let's just say in my class reunion, they said my wife, the angel of the class, is dating the demon of the class. <laughs> I've lived with that. Many that know me think that's still true. But the term woke. There was an incident in 1934 in Alabama where nine black boys got on a train, the boxcars in the train. There were two white girls in the same boxcars. Now, you know, back in that time with Jim Crowism, the last place that a brother wants to be caught is near looking at blowing oxygen towards a white woman. That could mean you're hung, you're castrated, you're burned alive. Ask Emmett Till. But in 1934, there was a man by the name of Hoodie Ledbetter. Hoodie Ledbetter. He was a black blues singer. And he wrote a song called the Scottsboro Boys. The Scottsboro Boys. And at the end of that song, these are his words. I advise everybody to be a little careful. Best stay woke and keep your eyes open. Now, he said that about being in Alabama with racism. And he knew what happened on that boxcar. He said, y'all best stay woke and keep your eyes open. All right? Now, also... There was a Jamaican philosopher by the name of Marcus Garvey. Mm, Y'all know about him. Marcus Garvey. Um, he was a Pan-African. And when he used to preach in the United States, these are his words. He would say, wake up, Ethiopia. Talking to the black population of America. Wake up, Ethiopia. Wake up, African. Those are words way back then about st staying awake, being woke, all right? Now, today, eight decades later,
from its use in history, the term woke has become weaponized in America. It, it, this is how language is repurposed for the advancement of whiteness. Because if you watch the news, which I do, and I watch the news and I, I call it speaking in tongues. I'm just not going to tell you this morning what tongues I speak in. But I did used to be a chaplain in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, so there's a special tongue there that you don't even use on Sunday morning in church. Now, W.E. Du Bois wrote a, he was the first Ph.D. sociologist from Harvard. And he wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folks. We credit W. Du Bois. He was the first African-born scholar that systematized the plight of black folks in America so that the intellectual whites could get an understanding. But I want you to see W. Du Bois had the same experience that Moses had in this respect. It, 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 it flows together. He said that black folks have a double consciousness because the term woke could also be the word consciousness. W. Du Bois said, blacks in America have a double consciousness. Well, a couple ways that I relate that. We are the people in America who we love America, but we hate what America did to us. Double consciousness. We are history's amnesiacs because we live with another people's memory. Black folks in America, being woke means, number one, the first time you woke up and discovered you were black. The second time you woke up is when you discover you're black. But that's a problem in America. I remember in my own life, in third grade, I went to all white schools. You're looking at a guy who've, who never had a black professor in his whole life up to this moment. When Bishop Bronner called me to say that he was two minutes ahead of me finishing his doctorate, he called me to stick it in me. I said, that, that's all right. But you know, all my professors, even in seminary, were white. And I wrote on the subject, my dissertation was, the good news for racism. You can't believe the hard time they gave me in my defense. It usually takes about 20, 25 minutes to defend. I was in there an hour and a half. Lord Jesus. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, because I know we're in church now. So when black folks use the term woke, we do it in this context of you discovered. So at I'll go back to this. I'm sorry. Third grade, I'm sitting in the class. All the students are white except me. Now, I was always, you know, second in my class all the way through school. There was a girl. Her name was Susan Hollowell. God rest her soul. Anyhow, she just always got one point higher than me every year. Now, I don't know if they were just favoring her or what. That's what I'm blaming it on. It couldn't have been that she was just smarter than me, you know. But what happened was the art teacher come into our class this day and said, all right, everybody get your crayons out. Gave us the paper, you know, like they give you an art class, a big sheet of paper. Put it on it. Everybody have pieces. He said, all right. She said, all right. Draw yourself. So I opened the crayon box for the first time in my life in class, but nobody had ever told me to draw myself. Now, everybody in the class, I mean everybody, was white. So when I opened the box, I kind of looked around, and they was all pulling out a white crayon. And I, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I was bewildered. 
but I became woke that day to I'm black and that's a problem in America in just a little way. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 14, the scripture says, Paul said to the church, awake, O sleeper, awake. And arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So there is the double consciousness of knowing we're born black, and that's a problem. But we are here this morning because we've had, we have a third consciousness, and that is Christ has awakened us. We were sleeping dead in trespasses and sin, but he woke us up, and now his light is shining upon us. Now, if we're going to be effective in the black community, here's the wisdom. If you're going to talk to our folks, you must, we must have an understanding of double consciousness. But we are calling them out of their double consciousness into a third consciousness of becoming woke in Christ. But we all can identify with their double consciousness. It's just that we've been redeemed. Now, I haven't forgotten the text. I'm laying the groundwork. Um, the issues in America are two, racism and justice. And racism and justice are at the center of the gospel. In 1964, Fannie Lou Hamer, she said this, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Have y'all, anybody in here ever felt like that? I'm just sick and tired. Every time I turn around, Tyree Nichols. I'm sick and tired, even when it's internalized racism. There's a book, there's a book called The Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery. It was a Willie Lynch theory, too, that said, if we teach black folks to hate themselves, then when you see another black folk, you will hate them because they remind you of yourself. Internalize. So how do five cops, black cops, beat up a brother on the streets of Memphis? I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, Martin, I'm, I'm writing a paper right now that next month I'm going to Oxford. And uh, I'm going to take about 40 people with me, and I'm going to give a lecture at Oxford because I want to attack Oxford. I got a little, I got a little problem with them that I want to, I want to deal with. All right. And Martin Luther King Jr. said in his book *Stride for Freedom*: If we're ever going to solve this problem of racism and injustice, we must find the root. Unless you lay axe to the root, this is going to be a perpetual problem. And I do believe I have discovered it, and that's what I'm writing on to deliver at Oxford. Now, let me give you this a little, little, little Reader's Digest version of what racism and justice the center of the gospel. See, one author said, to get to the root of racism, we have to learn is tr trace the genealogy of the lie. To get to the root, you must trace the genealogy of the lie. What is the theological lie that we're faced with? If I were to just jump right at it quickly, and then I'll tell you the book you can read if you're interested. Um, because during the pandemic for two years, I don't know what the Lord told you, but he gave me 50 books to read, and I read them. That's what I did during the past. Stayed in my house, 
walk my wife around the golf course, back to the house, sit at my desk, read 50 books, and gave 15 pounds. All right, here, here's, the, here's the genealogical lie. It's called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment touched countries like Germany, France, and England. And in Europe, the Enlightenment took over, it was the age of reasoning. But it was also John Calvin, the French theologian, who developed the doctrine of election. Now, that's not a bad doctrine all by itself, because I went to Reform Theological Cemetery, I mean seminary. <laughs> Did I say that? I was raised Church of God in Christ. I slipped up in, I slipped. Uh, anyhow, but anyhow, here's what happened. They took Reform theology, and this has been, when they all came to America from Europe, they came with this understanding of election. God has, through the Enlightenment, whites are God's elect. Whites are God's elect. And blacks and Native American Indians are God's non-elect. They also believed that as a result of that, they were superior at the at the top of the racial hierarchy and blacks were inferior. Now, I don't care how you look at America right now, but we must become woke to the idea that changing no laws are gonna change anybody's attitude unless we tear down the lie, the theological lie. You know when they, in movies where they wear them white wigs in court? You know what that means? They're the, we're, we're the most intelligent people. And we, through reasoning, can help everybody else. The doctrine of discovery said that we were the ones and we need to go. They didn't say go spread the gospel. They said, no, conquer. Take dominion. So you, so in the South... The Presbyterians came from England, from Europe, with the Enlightenment thinking, with the election, the visible saints of God, they're called. They're replacing Israel, the Puritans. But in the South, there is what's called the religion of the lost cause, because they lost the Civil War, right? But they said this, this is what the people in the South said, just like they stoned Moses, but he rose from being stoned. And then they crucified Jesus, but he rose from the dead. And even though we lost the Civil War, the South shall rise again. Because they believe Noah was the patron saint of plantation life. And that they were superior who were to give oversight to black folks. It was a paternalistic kind of attitude. Those poor boys and girls, they don't know any better. So black folks need somebody to help them. That's white folks. Now that was in the South, but in the North, it was the Puritans who believed that God had made them the elect and by double predestination, they believed some people, white, the visible saints, were predestined to heaven and blacks were predestined to hell. So if they're going to hell anyhow, why in the world do you want to give them property? Why do you want, they're just going to hell. They did the same thing in South Africa. You know what Bishop Desmond Tutu said? He said, when it comes to being woke, he said, some people won't wake up, but they're only pretending to sleep. I'm, 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 st I'm, gonna, I'm still on the text, all right? I'm still on the text, but, you know, Bishop told me, go ahead and get that, because... I'll never run for president, okay. Um, so we must understand that the last thing I'll say is this. Color consciousness is part of this imperious imperial because they said white is a sign of purity and that which is good. In my dissertation, I had the old, the old English Oxford Dictionary. 
And in it, it talks about white being pure, beautiful, loving, black, ugly, evil, vile. So guess what? They applied that to black folk. So no matter how educated you are, no matter how bourgeois you are, no matter how nice your car, no matter what neighborhood you live in, I, I remember reading in Ebony Magazine when I lived in Buffalo, this one black brother, he was, he, was, uh, he was CEO of a corporation and his office was in Manhattan. And so he came down, I forget how much his suit cost and his, his Rolex watch. He said, I couldn't get a yellow cab. So his white secretary came down and got the cab for him. He said, I realize no matter how much I'm wearing, no matter what position I'm in, it is a crime to be black in America. Now, these may sound like harsh words to some, but I, I need you to know for me, I do believe in reconciliation. And when I'm on television, I, I challenge any white preacher listening to me to meet me in Jacksonville, Florida, and I will sit down at Starbucks, anywhere you want, and we can talk about it because I believe God wants to right the wrong. That's called the righteousness of God, not in its truncated de definition of just justification, but righting the wrong, doing that which is just. God's attributes reflect his attitude, which are always in action. All right, that was a little theological right there. So, All right, now let's get back to the text. We have three texts that, I, that quickly I want to put in your memory. I want you to read in your own time Exodus chapter 2. Uh, yeah, Exodus chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 11, and um, Acts chapter 7. Now, the text said, when he got 40 years old, it came to him. The Greek says it arose in his heart. That's the moment he became woke. Now, why did we say that? Because you got to remember the story from Exodus chapter 2. The second Pharaoh took over that knew not Joseph. And he said, you know, we got to do something about these Negroes. They're growing. They're prospering. There are too many of them. So guess what? I want all the firstborn killed. Kill the male child. Now, what I don't have time for my sisters in the uh, cadre of clergy here to bring out is when you look at the story of Moses, the thing that is looked over so many times, do you know how many women paid, played a major role in preserving that boy's life to become the deliverer of Israel from Egypt? It went from his mama to his sister to the Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, my goodness. I mean, God used women to watch out for that boy. And women are still watching out for their boys today. Still watching out for their boys. So the Bible says in Acts 7.22 that Moses, as a young man, when he went through all he went through, he ended up the Pharaoh's daughter saw the boy. They put him through some nursing back to his mother, paid wages. And then he was th she was through nursing. Uh, she gave her back to Pharaoh's daughter. So he got raised as a slave that should have been killed. And I, I'm, 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 I'm just touching. That's why I gave you the verses so you can read it for yourself. The boy should have died. So he was raised in Pharaoh's court in Acts chapter 7. He was trained in all the wisdom of Egypt. I'm telling you, this boy got a PhD education. All right? Trained. And the scholars tell me he wasn't just trained in Egyptian wisdom. He knew Assyrian, Akkadian, Sumerian. I mean, he was in the, the house of the most powerful man on the planet as a Hebrew that should have been killed. But he's getting the best education. He's, he's, I mean, he's, he has, he has breakfast at Starbucks. Huh? But here's a phrase I don't want you to forget. 
Somewhere, and I'm extrapolating this thought, I'm extrapolating. Somewhere as he got closer to the age of 40, Moses began to suffer from cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Because the, the truth of Moses' life came to him. He was too much of an Egyptian at this time to be a Hebrew, but he was too Hebrew to be an Egyptian. I mean, that boy was toe up. Intellectually, emotionally, toe up from the flow up. But one day, he decided to catch an Uber from Pharaoh's court because it came into his heart. I got brothers and sisters in Goshen. Now, he knew they were there from when he was a little boy. But he became woke at 40, like never before. Oh, oh, hold on. I relate this to my life. I wrote a dissertation in a racist seminary. At least the president of the seminary at that time was. I won't say everybody was racist, but he was. But when George Floyd was murdered, you see all the young people out protesting. It was the first protest on racism that wasn't birthed in the black church. These young people did it all themselves, and a lot of them wasn't even safe, but they became woke to our plight. Now, how are they woke and the church is not woke? So when I... I was in a restaurant after George Floyd was murdered. And I was explaining to some of my white dear friends what happened to George. But in that restaurant that day, as I was going through the story with them, all of a sudden I broke out and cried like a baby in the restaurant. And I remember I put my head down, I was just sobbing, weeping. And they, they're sitting there at the table, and I'm just weeping. I just can't. They, I, that boy cried, called for his mother. Lord Jesus. If I'd have been standing, I called up my bishop friend, who he, he's in the same council of bishops that I'm part of, and I called him because this bishop used to hang out with Rap Bound, Stokey Carmichael. He, 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 he was a bad brother. And I called him, I said, Bishop, he said, don't tell me. I said, it's a good thing we weren't standing on that corner that day because they would have had to shoot and kill us because that cop would have taken his knee off his neck. Ain't no way I'm going to stand there and watch that. We would have died that day. Now, when I sat up in this restaurant with people, and I'm crying, and my wife will tell you, when I cry, I cry loud. Uh, uh, I do. I, I, I don't cry often in life. I was married 10 years before my wife ever saw me cry. So I don't cry often. But when I do cry, I go there. I get real ugly. Right? But when I sat up, I wiped my eyes. I sat up, and I sat up with this attitude. I'm totally woke. I don't care from this day forward. If white folks don't understand racism, they don't understand it, I can lose all my friends. But I, I'm going down to Goshen. I'm going to catch me a ride down to Goshen. Moses made a judicial visitation. A judicial visitation. Because he... That he went down there thinking, I got to do something about this plight. But for 40 years, he's like, oh, man, I'm living large. You know, I'm living large. You know, I'm just living large. Things are going well, you know. But it came to him. And I believe that was God's sovereignty. I believe the sovereignty of God watched over all those women who kept him alive for this calling. How, how much has God kept you alive for your calling? to be woke.
to racism and injustice in America because if we don't wake up, there's nobody else to wake up. Let me go on. So all his education, his living in the suburbs, God was going to use that in the end in the hood of Goshen. Huh? So thank God as Du Bois talked, Du Bois talked about the talented ten. But W. Du Bois was a young man. He was trained in White Harvard. All right? Got a PhD. But even he said, when he went south amongst my people, he said, I didn't know them and they didn't know me. Here's the thing. Our people didn't know that the man walking in their midst did more to enlighten the world to our plight than anybody else walking the street. But he didn't know them. And he was too black to be white at Harvard and too white from Harvard to be black in the South. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. So Moses, Stephen writes Acts 7. I'll say this quickly. Stephen writes Acts because if you read Acts 6, he's full of the Holy Ghost and he begins to preach and signs and wonders and miracles. And he, he starts laying a foundation about what God is doing and, and starts understanding the history. And the free men in the synagogue, they didn't like it. They didn't like it. So they went to Caiaphas, the high priest, and in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, the priest said to David, is this so? Stephen, in his last sermon, gives a running commentary on how God, because, see, they were worried about the reality that, you know, he was, he was, he was messing with the holy place and uh, tearing down the law of Moses. And he used Abraham and Moses to prove to the people leading to Christ the redemptive nature of God. Heil Geschichte, salvation history through Abraham, who they honored, and Moses, who they honored. He did that, and he did such a good job that Paul stood by holding the other's cloak while Stephen was stoned. But I like this about Stephen. He testified so well that he said, oh, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That boy preached like I want to preach till Jesus stands up. Wouldn't it be nice to know that the way you're living and the things you're doing, that Jesus would stand up and say, good God from glory, look at my child. Look at my child. The approbation of God. The smile of heaven because he is well pleased with his other son. Well pleased with his daughter. I mean, we ought to live and speak the gospel, even on racism and injustices, so that Jesus would stand up because the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice. Uh-huh. Now, I know this is a Baptist church. I should say Baptocostal. Right? I really don't care what denomination I'm in. I'm here to speak and I'm going to do that, right? Thank God for Bishop Troy. So, every male child is supposed to kill, be killed, right? But one day, it says that Moses, he wanted to make his judicial review. He saw an Egyptian mistreating his Hebrew brother. So, with no remorse in the text, he put, boom. He kills the Egyptian, right? Because he was already sensing the call of God on him. That's what the judicial review is about. Mistreat my brother? I, God wants me to do something about this, right? He kills him. Then the next day, he runs back to the hood, and two brothers are on the street corner arguing with each other. One getting ready to do a drive-by shooting on the other. He said, hey, 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 don't do that. They're like, oh, oh, oh. So who, who died and made you boss? You going to do to me what you did to the Egyptian? 
And then Moses realized that Pharaoh knew. Now the text says he feared and he ran. You know, sometimes we can get ahead of, we get little inklings of what God wants us to do. But in the end, I want to tell you, how, how do you make sure that you're doing what God wants you to do? That really is an important point. Now, so in Hebrews chapter 11, let's go there and let me wrap this up. Hebrews chapter 11, we talked about Stephen, he getting killed. But in Hebrews text, this pericope, talk, in chapter 10, the, the Messianic Jews, they're being so persecuted by the Judaizers that they're beginning to think about going back to Judaism just to get that monkey off their back. But the writer of Hebrews says, God will take no pleasure in you withdrawing. Then in Hebrews 11 and 1, it says, now faith. Now, I've heard some of my brothers and sisters talk about now faith. That, that's not later, that's now. But now is a conjunction in the Greek. De. It's not noon, noon, which is redealing with time, but it's de, which is a conjunction. It's like Hebrews chapter 10, all they're trying to withdraw, he stops and hold up. Therefore, you need to look at Moses because Moses, so let, chapter 11 is all about by faith, this one did that. By faith, this one did that. By faith, they didn't withdraw from their faith. By faith, they kept pressing in. And when he gets to Moses, he says, even though Moses, verse 23, he was born in Egypt. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. In other words, they saw the glory of God on him, the translucent glory of Almighty God. And they were, and it says he was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict, which was kill all them boys. Kill them all. By faith, those women kept Moses alive. By faith, his mama. By faith, his sister. By faith, Pharaoh's daughter kept that child alive because the will of God won't lead you where the grace of God won't keep you. The will of God won't lead you where the grace of God won't keep you. And when it is time for you to check out, who wouldn't rather be with Jesus than be here on earth with the devil? Mm-hmm. All right, it got quiet. I, 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 said, I said something wrong right there. So, but let's look out and see what, what, what Moses says here. It says, by faith, when he grew up, this is the other pericope that adds to the story of Moses, Look what it says in Hebrews 11. By faith, when he grew up, and it is time, brothers and sisters, for us to grow up in God. Grow up in God. It says, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There came a time in Moses' life when he became so woke that he was like, no, I, I've made a decision. I've made a choice that I'm not going to hang out in Egypt in Pharaoh's house and drink latte and act bourgeois. I've been down and seen the burden that is on my people. And I have awakened to the truth. And by faith, he said, I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh because the Hebrews up to they wanted to be known for this. And anything that made them popular, anything that eased their tension, and, you know, everything went, Moses took it on. I mean, he, he was refusing. He was known by Pharaoh, but he refused. He came to a place in his life where he was so woke that he said, I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh. Verse 25, choosing rather to be what? Mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. In other words, if you know better and yet you compromise, you're living in sin. I'm talking to all of us. If we have been woke, we can either be like the Hebrews in chapter 10 and try to go back or just keep quiet or look the other way and not say anything, not do anything. 
Moses said, no, nope, no, nope, I'm, 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 going, I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm going in. I refuse. He sent out an email. He hit it up on Facebook. The word got back to Pharaoh. He looked up. He said, what? What do you mean that boy killed a Hebrew? Now, let me tell you something. Pharaoh, his daughter may have brought him to the house. She may have raised him. But when Moses killed an Egyptian, that Pharaoh, he said, I should have never brought that Negro up in here. They should have never brought that Negro up in here. I'm going to chop that boy down. Now, the text says that he ran for his life in fear. But you read the other text and it says, fearing not Moses. I believe historically there's a difference between, you see, Moses only had an inkling for his judicial review. He got ahead of God with the calling. Anybody ever do that, get ahead of God? But the second part of his life, he stood before the burning bush and he heard God say, I am that I am. And I've heard the cry of my people. And I've seen their afflictions. Moses had been down to Goshen. He caught an Uber, went down there, checked it out, took chariots, Pharaoh's chariots, and went down, checked his brother, saw the burden on him. Now God from heaven is saying, I see it too. I see the burden and I hear the cry. And I've come down and I'm going to use you, Moses. And who, when, when they ask you who said, tell them I am that I am. So when Moses saw the true and living God in all his glory, in all his omnipotent power, now he says he is not afraid to forsake and be mistreated and stand against Pharaoh, even though Pharaoh is the most powerful man in the world, because he, looking forward and seeing the invisible one, Moses saw the invisible one. If we're going to stand against social injustice, and if we're going to stand against racism and not be overwhelmed because we are marginalized and we are minority in this country, we need to have stood before the burning bush. And when you realize that God is just like David before, before the giant, who is this uncircumcised heathen? that dare defy the armies of the living God. Listen, we can get so stirred up before the bush. I remember a, a, a lady who wrote a book called What's the Bible All About? And I read it as a new Christian in the Church of God in Christ. And I, and I read the book, and it said this woman, Henrietta, said about Amos. She said Amos wasn't raised with any credentials to be a prophet. But she said there was one thing about Amos' life that we can all learn from. Amos was a man who so feared God, he feared no man. Do you so fear God that you fear no man? If you have the fear of man, you need to get before the burning bush a little more often and behold him who is beautiful. And that you can say like Isaiah, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the angels cried, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the doorpost shook. And, and he said, listen, Isaiah said, Woe is me, oy vey, oy vey, woe is me. For I'm a man on unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. But my eyes have seen the king. Have your eyes seen the king. Then you're in your wokeness. In the midst of this country, the more of God's people who get up before the burning bush and hear God and hear the commission of Almighty God, that God is looking for a people that will come out of the darkness. Arise! Arise from your sleep. Get up from the dead. Dead wilding in racism. Dead putting up with injustice looking the other way, closing your ears, closing your eyes. You need to take a trip down to Goshen, walk through the ghettos, and you may be the kind of person that has a similar life of Moses in Pharaoh's court. Some of y'all have got a good education. Some of you got a nice looking house, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. But every once in a while, you need to go to the hood and see the burden of your brothers and sisters 
and we need to cry unto the Lord. Look at my people, oh God. Look at my people and hear God say, I'm sending you into the law system. I'm sending you into medical apartheid. I'm sending you over trying, people trying to get a house. I'm sending you because of mass incarceration. I'm sending you to deal with the execution, death penalty in innocent brothers and sisters. Life. I'm sending you to ride on the slave patrol to our daughters and sons that you can deliver them from pro police brutality. I'm sending you into a theological arena of institutions and seminaries and universities that are following the elect and non-elect that think that God has called them above. They are the visible saints of God and they've been lying about Jesus and the gospel. And I'm sending you to come out of your white spaces. As Carter G. Woodson said, the miseducation of the Negro. I was listening to a bishop the other day, and he said, you know, uh, I, I wasn't woke. And he said, uh, uh, he, has, he has a big church in California. He said, I would get called into meetings, and there will be a lot of my white brothers and sisters. And he said, I'd go in there, and, you know, I would just, I would just leave my chocolate at the door. But, 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 no, no, hear, well, hear him out. I'm being fair to him. It happened to Moses. He woke up and he said on TV, when George Floyd died, he cried like a baby. And he said, from now on, when I enter into a business meeting and I walk into a room, I'm taking my chocolate with me. Let that, listen, God has a destiny for the black people of America. God has a calling for us, but we've got to wake up. And I don't care about the amount of opposition. Have you seen my God? Moses walked back down to Pharaoh and said, yeah, you tried to kill me, but I am told me to tell you, let my people go. And the power of Almighty God was demonstrated in Egypt that God showed that all the gods of Egypt, the ten plagues, were against the ten gods that the Egyptians followed. And God defeated everyone to finally, Mo Pharaoh said, Moses, God is God. Listen, we've got to say, to walk up to people and say, listen, your racism and injustice is going to force me to get on my knees and I'm going to call out to God. And God tells me to tell you, if you don't let my people go, God's going to put a hurt on you. God's going to put a, it's called maledictory kind of prayers. We call down the judgment of God on those who oppose us and who won't get off our backs. When God is a just God who wants to right every wrong. So we've got to call out to God and quit crying for our situation, but cry out to God, Lord, look at my people. Help my people, Lord. Help my people, Lord. Help my people. I close with this. It's time to be woke. Ephesians 5, 14. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. What does it mean to be woke? If you're woke, you'll know it by four things. Are you aware of what's going on? Are you aware of what's going on? Number two, do you acknowledge what's going on? Number three, are you accountable for what you're aware of and acknowledge? And last of all, are you active in being woke? This is how we judge ourselves. 
This is what we do. I live in Florida. DeSantis is trying to shut down education. I, on, on, on national TV, I tell folks, I say, anybody that knows DeSantis that can get me hearing, I want to come before DeSantis. That Harvard graduate, I've lectured at Harvard. I want to come before him and say, God said, let my people go. You, because the beautiful thing for me is that even though all my teachers were white, all my students were white, here's the one thing I gained from it. I've never been intimidated by white people. Never. Never. I don't have a, I tell them, listen, if you're nervous, send me. Send me, because I will speak it. I will say it. Oh, yeah, I'll look them right in the face. Here it is. Yeah. So God can take advantage of all of our backgrounds and the good things that have happened to use for the sake of our people. Would you stand with me? There may be some here today. You've never committed your life to Christ. But the verse says, arise from the dead. Awake, sleeper. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. He'll give you life. You may be suffering from cognitive dissonance. You may be floundering in the quicksands of an existential mood. You may be lost in the darkness. But today, the Lord says, arise, sleeper, and let Christ shine on you. If you commit your life to Christ, it's just not from personal redemption, but it's a redemption from sin-imposed oppression from oppressors. What God is going to use, and I close with this. Here's what I think God's going to do. I told you I was going to Oxford. Well, what we're going to initiate is we are going after all seminary educational institutes. And anyone that espouses parts of the enlightenment and the elect that sees us at the bottom, we are going to expose that lie. We're going to expose that lie because that lie, that lie has got to die. And they're not going to kill it. Now, there are some whites who will be our allies, and I thank God for them. But I ain't waiting for them. When I go to Oxford, the Enlightenment came from Oxford. When I get at the Manchester Herod Hall, where I'll be, and they're going to televise and film the whole event, I'm going to get dead in their business. They don't ever have to get me back. They don't have to have me back. I don't need anything from there. Now I am going to get a hoodie, an Oxford hoodie. So if the cops pull me over, I got an Oxford hoodie. March, March 20 through the 24th, I'll be there. And I'm taking 40 people with me, some brothers and sisters who can fire. I mean, these are PhD academics. I wanted Bishop Troy to be there. That brother can fire. Lord have mercy. He's my favorite preacher. I know he's on sabbatical. Anyhow, God's going to help us. If you haven't committed your life to Christ, I'm going to pray for you and maybe other pastors will take care of it. But for you Christians, I pray that you will recognize it's time to be woke. Our nation is at a crossroad. It's time. Oh, you got to listen to the Republicans and Democrats, what's all going on. Where is the church? We've got the only voice that has a solution. We're supposed to be the baddest folks on the planet. I'm tired of them thinking that, well, if you're Muslim, we're scared of the Muslim. I, you know, come on, we're the ones. Martin and Malcolm had a discussion about disagreeing over strategies. 
finally Malcolm looked at Martin and said, well, you know, Martin, we're both glorious old fools because guess what? Because of what we speak, truth to power, you know, we're both dead men. Stephen died for his testimony. You shall receive power, dunamis, after the holy, that you will be my witnesses. The word witness is the Greek word martyr. If I have to die for the will of God, I want to die fulfilling the will of God. I don't want to die on the back porch drinking Kool-Aid. Because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Father, today, let your blessing be on your folks. Let us all be woke as never before, Lord. We look at Moses, the way you use him to be a deliverer. Lord, we need many deliverers today, not just one Moses. We need people that have the same experience of Moses and the spirit of Moses, even in the New Testament, to deal with racism and injustice and the lie. We're willing to destroy the lie. We are not an inferior people, and they are superior. But Lord, I pray that you'll raise up black men and women and white allies, and you'll give us the resources to build institutions, public policy, Lord, banking, everything else that we need to get our voice out there, TV, media, radio, everyone. Get the word out there about the truth, because just like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he testified coming to, from Germany with two PhDs at 24. He testified he saw black Jesus in Harlem at Abyssinian Baptist Church. He became born again. And that man gave his life in Germany. They hung him. But now even Cornell West is chairing the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Society at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. I thank you, Lord, that this month I'm going to go up and meet Cornell by his invitation. I thank you for that. And I ask you to bless this congregation and this, this great, great, great man of God, Bishop Froner. I just pray, Lord, we so need him. We so need him, his voice, we need him, and I pray that you will give him great rest and recovery and use him and this congregation, Elam Fellowship and all these clergy and deacons and saints to turn the world upside down for the glory of God. Amen and amen. Come on, let the church say amen. amen. Give it up for Bishop Van Gaten. What a word. Did he bless us this morning? Come on, put your hands together for that word. Awesome word. Kicking off our Black History Month. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you so much. The man of God already gave the invitation. And so if you're here today and you never said yes to Jesus Christ, before you leave, before you leave, before you leave, you're here, just slip that hand up and we wanna pray with you. Just slip your hand up. You've never said yes to Jesus Christ. We wanna offer you this wonderful gift of salvation Just take a step of faith and come forward if your hand is up and you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. I see one coming. Amen. 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 God.
God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my brother. Is there another, is there another hand? Did I see another hand in the back? Amen. Come on, come on, give it up for our brother who just gave his life to the Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. You can take him in the back. Certainly we were blessed by that word today. Bishop, thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping us to get woke. It's time, my brothers and sisters. Amen. 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 And these are they who came to turn the world upside down. God bless you. God bless you. If you um, miss communion this morning, we're going to ask that you come.